Good morning. You guys can open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to finish off chapter 6 today as well as finish off our Kingdom of Growth series. And I actually want to, to begin by welcoming a few of our friends that are joining us from online. And many of you guys are traveling for the summer. I just want to remind you we have this option available. So Becky from Memphis, not afraid from Charlotte. I love that. It's going to fit really well with today. John in Santa Claus, Indiana. Yes, it's a real place. Shelby, all the way out in the Czech Republic, is joining us this morning, as well as the Chris family traveling back to Bloomington. And so some travelers, some settled all over the world joining us today as we begin this sermon on anxiety. And as soon as you hear that word, maybe your palms start to sweat a little, the heart starts to race a little bit. It's an experience that all of us face to some extent or another. And so I just want to read Matthew chapter 6 to kind of lay the groundwork for where we're heading today. We're going to talk about anxiety as we finish our Kingdom of Growth series. And so verse 25 of Matthew chapter 6 says this, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Three times in those couple of verses, Jesus says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. And again, now that I've said the word about a dozen times in the sermon, maybe now the palms are sweating, the heart is racing, and you're starting to have a visceral kind of in-body experience of anxiety. Anxiety can be described in a number of emotional words, a number of emotions, a number of feelings. It might be manifesting in fear. It's when we're afraid. It's when we're uneasy. It's when we're nauseated, nervous, restless. It's when we're preoccupied with something. It's when we're worried, when we're scared, when we're tense, when we're fearful, when we're terrified, when we're insecure, indecisive, hypervigilant, and cautious. And you may have noticed in verse 30, that little phrase again, we used it of Peter a couple of months ago when we were talking about Peter sinking in the waves. Oh, you have little faith. And sometimes as Christians, we're a little bit insensitive to anxiety, and and we kind of think of it as the affliction of the unfaithful. Anxiety is not the affliction of the unfaithful. In fact, it's a natural response to a fallen world. A few weeks ago, we talked about anger and how all of us as image bearers of God have this capacity for anger. And in Genesis 1 and 2, there was just no reason to be angry. Everything was harmonious. Everything was perfect. Everything was integrated and as God intended it to be. And in Revelation 19 and on into eternity, there's no reason for anger. There's also no reason to be anxious. Anxiety is an experience that you and I have between Genesis 3 and Revelation 19. And it's not unique to us. In fact, every page of Scripture, you might be able to to argue, every page of Scripture includes people feeling anxious. All the way back to the patriarchs. Do you remember our, our forefather, Abraham? You think he got a little bit anxious when the delay in God's promise of a son took effect? There's a whole episode with Hagar that would probably justify thinking that Abraham got a little anxious. You think he got a little anxious walking up the mountain when God had commanded him to sacrifice his son? You think he was a little nauseated at that experience? You think Moses was was nervous? You think he was a little bit uneasy about going back to Pharaoh? In fact, he says, I don't, I don't want to go. I'm not a good talker. He didn't have confidence. He didn't have surety in his ability to speak and to liberate the people. We see it in David throughout the Psalms. We see it in, in, in all of the, the prophets. There's this general anxiety that the people of God were experiencing. We see it in the exile. People like Esther. You think Esther was a little bit nervous about going before the king? 
a little bit uneasy about that, a little tense. She asked her uncle Mordecai to have the entire people fast on her behalf because it was such an extreme experience, such an intense experience, such an uneasy, unnerving, disorienting experience. We see it as Ezra starts to lead the people back. We see it with Nehemiah building the wall of Jerusalem. We see it in, in the Gospels. We see it in John the Baptist sending his disciples as he's in prison to ask Jesus' disciples, hey, is Jesus the one? Is he the one or not? We see it in a host of Jesus' companions. I think we see it in Jesus himself. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. We see it in the New Testament. Paul talks about it. We see it in the, the people of Corinth with regards to their marriages. We see it in the people of Philippi with regards to their giving and their concern for the missionaries that they had sent around the world. We see it all throughout the scripture. Anxiety is not the affliction of the unfaithful. We all experience it. And we would be wise as Christians to destigmatize it from our vernacular and begin to talk about it with a little bit more sensitivity and compassion. In fact, I think that there's a divine reason that we experience anxiety. I like to think of it not as, you know, being a worry wart or a wet blanket. You guys all know those people, right? Oh, that's the person who's a wet blanket on the team, or that's the person who's just a, a worry wart. I like to think about uh, anxiety on a, on a spectrum. And there are different kinds of experience of anxiety. At this end of the spectrum, low-level anxiety is, is modest. It's what you feel when you get a little bit uneasy, a little bit tense. It's, it's, it's modest, but it's also manageable. You, know? it, it, you can continue on with the rest of your day. You can continue on with the rest of your life. It, it's temporary. It kind of comes and goes. And all of us, I think, to some extent, in different ways and in different things, experience low level anxiety. On the other side, this is where anxiety is, is, is intense. I mean, it's, not, it's no longer a modest experience of uneasiness. It's an intense experience, and it's, it's no longer manageable. It becomes excessive. It becomes bigger than anything we can handle. It becomes pervasive. It starts to invade all these different elements of our lives. We have to think about anxiety on a spectrum. All of us have different things that strike at different levels on this spectrum. Why is it? I think it's because anxiety kind of serves as like a a guardian of our soul. If you follow along in the E News, I call it the Sentinels of the Soul. They kind of, they kind of, you know, have, have we've developed this response because it helps us think ahead about potential threats. Anxiety is actually a survival mechanism. We think about bad things that might happen in order to pre-plan for them, so that in case they happen, we don't have to expend a lot of mental energy in the moment. They're kind of these, these guardians, these sentinels of our soul that say, hey, you might want to keep an eye out for some things. In fact, there's a, a psychologist who was talking about, uh, they, they have this study that, that I've never found it, so it may be a made-up story, <laughs> of, a, of a troop of chimpanzees. And what they found was that certain chimpanzees in this troop, they, they displayed the, you know, anxiety, they displayed anxious activity, and so they removed the anxious ones. They took away the worry warts and the wet blankets from the troop. You know what happened within two years? The entire troop was dead. They'd lost those, that, that's those survival kind of sentinels. They'd lost the guardians of the troop. But what happens for us as people is, is we have these, these guards, and they're kind of like security guards, but eventually, and over time, some of them become like a standing army. They become the defining features of our personality. They become, we become more driven by, by fear than anything else. Or, or at other times, some of them... Some of those sentinels, or maybe one of them, will move to the center, and we become defined by that fear. We become defined by that anxiety. When Jesus says, don't be anxious, I don't think he's saying, don't feel anxious. I think he's saying, don't be defined by your anxiety. Don't let it rule your life. Don't make it your Lord. These preoccupations and these fears... These things that I believe alert us to the potential areas of spiritual growth. They're like little triggers in our soul. Saying, hey, there's some growth that can happen here. Something can happen here. Anxiety is a great servant, but it is a terrible tyrant. 
It's meant to guard our souls against potential threats. And as Christians, we can listen to those alerts and we can hear Jesus' words today. Don't be anxious. Don't be defined by those preoccupations and those fears. Don't let them grow out of control. Anxiety alerts us to areas of spiritual growth. And I think that's why in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, we see that phrase again. Oh, you have little faith. There's just a small quantity of faith there that I think could be grown. And as we wrap up this Kingdom of Growth series, I think it's important that we acknowledge all the ways in which we grow. The things that scare us, the things that make us uneasy, the things that make us nervous, the things that make us tense, the things that make us nauseous are areas in which our faith can grow. The first alert that we see in Matthew chapter 6 are our needs, our basic survival needs. And I think it's hard to know you know, back in the first century, whether Jesus was addressing a, you know, a group of, of completely poor and food insecure people, you know, in the northern part of Galilee, it, it isn't booming metropolis area. There probably isn't a ton of wealth or affluence in the area. And so the majority of the people that he was speaking to were probably food insecure. But it's possible that Matthew and some of the other tax collectors and the people that he rolled with or some of the Romans in the the area that may have been listening to the Sermon on the Mount, there may have been a mixture of both the afflicted and the affluent this day on the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, it would be odd for Jesus to spend so much of the Sermon on the Mount talking about money if there weren't people in the audience who had money. And so when we think about our needs, I think for us, a lot of us in, in affluent culture or in less food, you know, more food secure environments, many of us, we, we stress, we get anxious about meal planning. You know, like, oh my gosh, what are we going to eat this week? Oh my gosh, what are we going to have for lunch? Oh my, and, and, and in all reality, the experience of anxiety, the mental pathways, all this stuff that goes, it's the same. It's the same as the experience for somebody who's food insecure. Now, the context is not the same. Okay, food insecurity is a very real issue within our town, within our world. It's something that we would all be wise to pay attention to. But for some people, it's not about meal planning. For some people, it is about meal provision. And so whichever basic need kind of speaks to your situation, your scenario today, I want you to look at the birds. What can you learn? What can we learn from the birds? Whether you're stressed about meal provision or about meal planning, what is it that we can learn from the birds? Jesus says in verse 25, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Is not life more than food? Isn't life more than food? Didn't we talk about that a little bit last week with fasting? Isn't there something more to our souls than our stomachs? If you look at the birds, they neither, this is what it says in verse 26, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. The birds are not manufacturers. The birds are not manufacturers. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than them? I came across a poem this week by Elizabeth Cheney. It's entitled, The Robin and the Sparrow. And I just want you to imagine for a second if birds could talk, okay? Mental leap, I know. But envision you know, kind of a robin and a sparrow sitting on their branch, or maybe one's on the fence, one's on the branch, and this is what they speak to one another. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think it it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Why do we rush about and worry so? Why are we so anxious? Why are we such an industrial culture? We live in a modern world that celebrates industriousness, right? What you produce, what you manufacture, what you do. In fact, many of us hear this passage and and we kind of write off like, hey, you know what? People should just work for a living. That's what they should do. And and I don't think that this is an exemption from work. In fact, if you take the entirety of the New Testament passages like 2 Thessalonians 3, where Paul is talking about their labor in Thessalonica, he says, hey, if you don't work, you don't eat. I think that there's there's something to be said about diligence and about effort. The birds don't just sit there with their beaks open and wait for the hand of God to drop seeds or insects in it. 
I mean, they're active, but they don't worry about it. They don't stress about it. They're not anxious about it. They're not paralyzed by preoccupations. Why is that? Because they know that their heavenly Father provides. There's something to be learned about or learned from the birds, and I think it's this, that our heavenly Father's provision is greater than our production. And if you're the kind of person that, that wants to be diligent and wants to work, I think that that's good. I think that that's noble. I think that that's pure. I think there's a great example of that in Martha in Luke chapter 10. She is eager to host the Lord. She can't wait for Jesus to come into her house and his disciples. And she is playing the role of first century hospitable host. She is going to the max. And it says in Luke chapter 10 that she gets anxious in her serving. She gets preoccupied with her serving so much so that she misses the presence of the Lord and Savior in her home. I think many of us are so industrious, so productive that we miss the Lord in the midst of it. And this is not an exemption from caring for those who are food insecure. This is not an exemption from applying Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus says, when, do, you know, when did you guys feed the hungry? When did you clothe the naked? When did you bring in the homeless? When did you do all of that stuff? You have to take this in the context of its entirety. Martin Luther King said, it's incredibly ignorant and insensitive to tell a man to pull himself up by the bootstraps when he doesn't have any boots. We live in a world where the problem isn't with the supply. The problem is with the distribution. And so this isn't an exemption from work. It's also not an exemption from compassion and justice. The problem in our world is not with God's supply. He has provided more than enough to meet our basic needs for all people. But many of us get anxious and worried because we're too concerned with production and not aware of his provision. The second alert, I think, goes to the layer of wants. You know, I, I think when he starts talking about it again in, in verse 25, he says, you know, that the body is more than clothing. There's something to be said about this clothing element. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Here he says to consider the lilies of the field. Why are you anxious about clothing? Why are you anxious about the non-essentials? Why are you anxious about the things that adorn or decorate or what we would consider in Western culture to be luxurious? Why are there so many brand wars? You know, like this past week, I was up at a mall. It was the Nordstrom annual sale. And you're just walking through. It's like labels, brands, labels, brands, labels, brands, labels, brands. And we're walking through the mall. I'm like, oh, my gosh, they have a free people. <sighs> you know, like, I, I don't know. It's just a name. And, yeah, there's a quality to those products. There's something that's associated with that name. But have you ever just thought about how, how silly that might look or sound to the sparrows and the robins? Or maybe to the flowers of the field? Who, who today are alive and tomorrow are thrown into the fire. It says that not even Solomon, not even Solomon in all of his glory was as beautiful as a simple field flower. They grow without toiling or spinning. They grow without excessive worry. They grow without toil or spinning. It's alive today and thrown away into the oven tomorrow. Won't God much more clothe you? What can we learn from the flowers? I think that our brand wars are indicative of, of what we see in, in Luke chapter 8 when we hear the, the parable of the sower. And he talks about the seed that falls on good soil and it starts to grow. But then it starts to get choked out by other things. It gets choked out by wants and desires and luxuries. In Luke chapter 8, they're called the cares of the world, the same word, similar word family to anxieties, the cares of the world, the cares of the world. They choke out the good work that God is trying to do in our soul. What can we learn when we consider the flowers of the field? Maybe, there's, maybe there is more to the body than there is to clothes. Have you, have you ever experienced cancer? someone in your family or, or you personally? Are, can, are cancer patients concerned with what they'll wear when chemo's over? 
Isn't there more to the body than what you put on it? In fact, the scriptures talk about this. The scriptures say in, in Romans chapter 8, Paul says, I don't think that the present sufferings of this world are even worth comparing to the eternal glory that is to come. Is it possible that nothing we wear in this life will be as glorious as the body God sows in eternity? Is it possible that that's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, in a moment, something's going to happen, and what was sown perishable is going to be reborn imperishable. What was sown mortal is going to be reborn immortal. What was made for a time to exist is actually going to be transformed into something more glorious and beautiful and splendid than anything you have ever seen. Is it possible that there is a treasure, a glory far beyond the brands we wear? Is it possible that the Father's promises are more glorious than our pursuits? That the things he holds out forever are way more valuable than the things that choke out the health of our soul? The cares of this world will choke the gospel out of your soul. And you won't flourish in this life. The body is more than brands. It's not about what you put on. It's about who we become. We can learn a lot from the birds and the flowers. But the third alert has to do with our anxiety about tomorrow. You know, we, have these, we have these anxieties about our needs, our, our basics, our essentials, and then we have these anxieties about our, our wants, our desires, our, our luxuries, and, and then we also have this anxiety about what the future is going to hold and what's going to happen tomorrow and how is everything going to play out and how is it all going to turn out. And this is what Jesus says at the end of chapter 6. He says, therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What can we learn from the world? He says, you know, the, the Gentiles or the unbelieving world, everybody is seeking after the basics and the essentials. Everybody is worried about tomorrow. Everybody is lorded over by their anxieties, their fears. And many of the people in our lives, and if we're honest with ourselves, many of us at time, from time to time, we just think, if I only had fill in the blank, then I wouldn't be so worried. If I only had more of something, more money, more influence, more power, more control, if I only had more of something, then, then I wouldn't be so anxious. I wouldn't be so worried about tomorrow. If I could just make sure I knew exactly what was going to happen and have complete agency to make that happen. If I didn't have these uncertainties, then I would be okay. He says the Gentiles are asking the questions. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? They seek after all these things. That's what their pursuits are. They're going after all of these things. That's the first thing on their mind. What do we eat? What do we wear? What do we drink? What's going to happen? Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He knows. He knows exactly what you need, everything that you need. He knows. He knows it in its entirety. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You know what I have found with seeking stuff? Mo mammon, mo problems. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I used to think, well, if I, when, I, when I get married, I'm gonna, uh, my anxiety about being single will be gone. You know what happened when I got married? I started worrying about my wife. We, we wanted to have kids. We're like, oh, when we have kids, our lives will be filled with so much joy and enrichment. You know what happened when we had kids? We started worrying about our kids. I thought, man, when I, have, when I make this amount of money, we just, we're just trying to make ends meet, but if I could just get up to this level, then all that would be fine. We would, you know, and I was looking at buying a bigger house and spending more money. It's just like, I, the anxiety just keeps coming. More stuff brings more anxiety. And some of that stuff in its origin is good and beautiful stuff. But none of it was made to be at the center point of our soul. Anxiety grows with resources and responsibilities. Anxiety grows with resources and responsibilities. It's not eliminated. Once you have everything you need and once you have everything you want, you start worrying about losing everything you have. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 
In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, he says, you know, there's two treasures that people go after. There's two ways of looking at your life. There are two masters that we serve. And you really just, you can't be divided. You got to be all in on heavenly treasures, the kingdom of light, and your Lord and master, Jesus Christ. You got to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What do we learn from the world Our heavenly father's righteousness yields more peace than riches. If you're looking for the opposite of anxiety, what did they experience in Genesis 1 and 2? And what do we hope for in eternity, Revelation 20 and onward? What do we hope for? What What are we aching for? What are we longing for? What is our soul craving? Our soul is craving peace. The opposite of anxiety is peace. And we're made to live in this harmonious, unified, integrated, beautiful state of peace. And you know what? Stuff doesn't bring it. People don't bring it. The peace that your soul is thirsting for does not come separate from the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the other stuff comes after. All the other stuff is added after the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I really, really, really wish that this passage didn't end with verse 34. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. But just like we're not exempt from work, and just like we're not exempt from caring for other people, we're also not exempt from trouble. Jesus doesn't promise the absence of troubles. In fact, in in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. It's going to be hard. It's broken. It's fallen. There's, There's stuff that is going to make you anxious. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be evil and wickedness and injustice. There's going to be pain and brokenness. In this world, you will have trouble. And then he says right after that, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Take heart, I have overcome the world. A new day tomorrow will bring new trouble tomorrow. Just like today brought some level of trouble. Probably started in the parking lot. (laughs) You know, it's always something, right? It's always something. It's always something. New day, new trouble. New day, new trouble. Sufficient for the day. Every day is going to have new trouble. But there's this beautiful passage in, in Lamentations chapter 3 about what happens every day. In Lamentations 3, verse 22, it says, The steadfast of love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. New new troubles bring new mercies. And new mercies bring new growth. And so each and every day when we face trouble, we experience God in a new way. Each of our preoccupations, each of our anxieties, each of our stressors, each of our fears alert us to an aspect of our faith that can grow, where we can experience new Mercy, I grew up in this old school church, old school church, like older school than the Bloomington campus, old school church. And in that church, there was one hymn that we used to sing all the time that I felt like was really driven by the men. And I don't know why, but the, 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 just the memory that I have of this song is, is like, it was like uh, the, this little church, the pews, the stained glass would start shaking, you know, because it was just like full-throated worship. And it's a, a song that was written in 1923 by a guy named Tom, Thomas Chisholm, but it was, it was anchored in Lamentations 3, and, and it just seemed, this song just seemed to come from a deeper place, the kind of place where we can take our pain and turn it into praise, the kind of place that says, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All, all these things, all these worries, all I have needed 
Thy hand hath provided. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. A new day brings new trouble. A new day brings new mercy. New mercies bring new growth. And that's what this Kingdom of Growth series has really been about. It's how God's great faithfulness grows our little faith. God's great faithfulness grows our little faith. I'd like to invite you guys to stand with me today. Go ahead and stand. We're going to flow through a few scriptures here, but I, I just... So preparing this week, I, I don't know, and I don't know how much pain, how much uncertainty, how much stress, how much fear, how much anxiety is in a room of this size. But I would imagine if we could feel it the way God feels it, it would be heavy. And I think we, we have to, we have to destigmatize it. We have to get away from our fear of talking about it. And there's just a, a few things that I'd like to do as we make an invitation this morning, an invitation to prayer. I just, I'd like you to think about what troubles you today. What is it that's troubling you today? Sufficient for the day are their own troubles. I know you walked in with stuff today. I know you walked in with stress. I know you walked in with fear. I know you walked in with preoccupations. I know you walked in today with worries. What is it that's making you anxious? Have you identified it? It'll probably change the way you worship if you can at least acknowledge what it is. In 1 Peter 5, it says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. God cares about whatever it is that's stressing you out. He wants you to cast it on him, to, to literally throw it down before him. He'll receive it because he cares for you. He's that kind of God. He's not disinterested. He's not going to rebuke you. He's not going to call you stupid for worrying about that. He cares too much about you to hurt you like that. And in Philippians 4, it says this. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, every detail, every matter of life, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you are seeking peace today, then I want to invite you forward. Bring your trouble up to one of our staff members, elders, or volunteers who are up here to pray with you today. Bring your trouble. Let's cast your anxiety before the Lord. And with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let's let our requests be made known to him so that the peace of God, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You don't have to be anxious. He offers peace.